Hank. Good, good day, everyone. It's the 8th of March. It's our uh, monthly um, meeting of the Progressive Legacy. And it's good to see as many happy faces as I do see today. We're going to have three speakers today. One is uh, Marilyn Pierre. One is Thomas P. Johnson III. And Mr. Reamer will be coming in a little short, a little in a little while. I just wanted to tell you this has been a, a lot of fun putting this together and uh, aggravating to all those good people who have uh, helped me. But uh, thank you again, all of you. And my wife is going to read the bios of each individual um, speaker, so I won't stumble all over that. And uh, I hope that uh, we will have a good and open discussion. And we were thinking that if you have any knowledge of this workings of this uh, computer, that you could possibly save uh, a question to chat and then raise your hand that you want to have an answer to a question that you have. We will try to entertain that. And as I was telling Alan earlier, well, we're gonna mess up, but we'll, we'll get better at this. So I would like to turn this uh, meeting to Marilyn Pierre. Helen, would you like to read? Sure, my mic open? Yes, you're being heard. Okay. Marilyn Pierre is running for circuit court judge. She has been practicing law for over 30 years. She practices family law, criminal law, probate law, and juvenile law, among others. As a result of her knowledge of family law, she was appointed as family law facilitator by the Montgomery County Circuit Court. She served in the position for almost 10 years. Marilyn is a retired officer in the United States Army Mil Reserve Military Police Corps and a former chair of the Montgomery County Criminal Justice Coordinating Commission. Among her numerous honors and awards, Marilyn is a three-time recipient of the Daily Record's Maryland Top 100 Women and she is admitted to Maryland's Top 100 Women's Circle of Excellence. Marilyn was recently recognized as one of the heroes of Montgomery County by the Patuxent chapter of the Lynx. Marilyn and her husband, Reynold Pierre-Louis, have been married for over 28 years. They have two sons and a daughter. Marilyn, would you like to address our little group? Well, well first of all, I would like to say good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry, every time <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Craig's granddaughter waves, I just have to wave back. It's just instinct for me. Thank you so much to Progressive Legacy for having me here. I love attending your meetings and I am so honored to be a guest today. I also want to thank Helen for doing such a great job preparing everything and awesome job reading the bio. And Hank, you are in good hands with Helen. <laughs> I, I know that you also did a very good job and you are going to continue to do a very good job moderating. So thank you very much, everyone. And I also want to say thank you to Progressive Legacy and its members for being such a great support throughout the years. I really appreciate your support. And I know that, you know, no, no, I know that sometimes it's hard to thank everybody individually, but I know what you do and I see what you do and I am keeping track of it. So thank you so very, very much, everyone. My name is Mary Lynn Pierre and I am a candidate for Montgomery County Circuit Court Judge. Like Helen said, I've been practicing law for over 30 years in Montgomery County. I've actually been licensed to practice law over 31 years because I was licensed in Pennsylvania first. Yeah. And I'm also licensed in the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the state of New York, several uh, federal courts, and also the United States Supreme Court. Uh, it, it, it's a lot, but <laughs> that, that's what happens. <clears throat> I love serving my community, and I grew up thinking that I was going to serve my community as a lawyer. It happened when I was 12 years old. It happened on July 2nd, 1978, which was Thurgood Marshall's 70th birthday. On that day, I heard a radio program that talked about Thurgood Marshall and the accomplishments that he had done being a lawyer. And I said, oh my gosh, I am so in awe of this man and so in awe of what he was doing uh, to help his people and the community. Well, I shouldn't say his people because he helped so many people. 
that I decided that I was going to be a lawyer. I had not met a lawyer. I wasn't sure what a lawyer does, but for whatever reason, in my 12 year old mind, all I needed to do was to speak a lot, to argue a lot and to read a lot. And I did all of those things. And so I said, okay, you know what? I was fine with, with that. I did not actually meet a lawyer until my second year in college. <laughs> so I don't know what sustained me from 12 years old to you know, a sophomore in, in college, but it did. And I really, really am glad that happened because I love the practice of law. I, I really enjoy helping people using the law. I love educating people about their rights and, and their responsibilities. And when I explain the law to people, they understand it and they, and they see where they fit in all of its intricacies. <laughs> and, and they understand the responsibility that we have to each other when we're using the law. And so I was happily going along practicing law, doing my thing. And then I started noticing that some people did not have the love of the law or they did not appreciate the, the way other people were affected by the law. And that really became bothersome to me. It, it was extremely bothersome because I still had my 12 year old innocence when it came to the law. I really thought that the law was something that was there to help people. Uh, we come in, for instance, into a courtroom and we understand that people are there for a reason. We treat them with compassion, dignity and respect and we move on to the next case. But time and time again, I saw that that was not happening. And that's why I decided to apply to become a judge. That, that did not work. So then I decided to come to the people and ask them to vote for me for judge, which under the Maryland constitution, I am able to do so. <laughs> well, one of the cases that really, really got to me, and one of the reasons why I said that I was going to try to do something about it is because I could not live with the idea that the people that I was trying to help were being mistreated. So I'll give you an example. I represented this woman whose 16 year old daughter came to her and told her that her stepfather was doing things to her that he should be doing with his wife. And so my client did the right thing and kicked him out of the house and brought criminal charges against him. My client and the stepfather had a child together. And so his 14 year old son went to visit him. The stepfather told his 14 year old son to go and kill my client's daughter because the stepfather did not want to have a witness against him in the criminal case. The 14 year old son was highly suggestible, <laughs> uh, highly suggestible. And he went and tried to kill his sister. Fortunately, uh, he was not able to kill her. And so, uh, and, and, and so the, the sister survived, but my client knew that he was going to try again because his goal was to do what his father asked him to do. My client, did, uh, my client again did the right thing. She went and she called the Department of Health and Human Services. This is what is called in Montgomery County. In other counties, it's called the Department of Social Services, but she called the Department of Health and Human Services. They came and they said that they were going to remove the 14 year old son because he was a danger to his sister. My client out on the curb because had she done that, he would have been a neglected child and she would have faced criminal charges for that. So we go to court and uh, we, we, we are in the courtroom. Everybody introduces themselves. After everybody introduces themselves, the interpreter introduces herself. After that, the judge turns to my client and after everything that she's been through, she's distraught. She is concerned that she is going to have to give up one of her child, basically kick him out of the house through no fault of her own. But the first thing that the judge says to her is that, it, it, well, I'm sorry, the first thing he says to her is, why don't you speak English? And I said, your honor, that is inappropriate. Well, she needs to tell me why she doesn't speak English. And I'm like, your honor, that's inappropriate. That is not why we're here. 
Well, uh, we we went back and forth like that until you know the judge had to have the last word, and he said to her that when we come back in six months, if you don't learn how to speak English by then, I am going to hold you in contempt of court and put you in jail. That really, really, really bothered me. It bothered me that this woman who had done everything that she was supposed to do, this woman who was already victimized by her husband is now coming to court. And instead of getting compassion and understanding from the court, she is being re-victimized by the court. It also bothered me because I'm from Haiti. I am not, English is not my first language. And so the idea that somebody like me could have some time walk into a courtroom with a problem like that and to have someone treat me that way was, was just heartbreaking. And so I, I, I am running for judge because I think that we need to have more understanding judges. We need to have judges who hold people accountable for what they need to be held accountable for, but they, they could serve compassion with mercy. They don't have to be so harsh. When you, when you look at the, the robingroom.com, you'll see that there are good judges on there. there. There are people who are rated a tens even out of 10, but the majority of them, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I think 18 out of the 42 who are listed have a failing grade if 60 is, is passing. And we need to choose our own judges. We shouldn't have to agree with what the governor says are these, uh, are these people who they who are appointed. We don't have to go and blindly select these people just because they were selected by a group. And I implore you, next time they say, well, I was vetted, I was selected, you ask them, who, who did you know on the governor's commission? Who was able to speak to you? Uh, uh, and who was able to speak on your behalf to the governor? And that is going to be very, very telling. For the past couple of years, we've had a law partner who keeps putting his law partners <laughs> in front of the governor. So if those are the people who are put in front of the governor, those are the people that the governor is going to appoint. But my main point is that you choose for yourself, just like we don't have anybody in, in, uh, in closed rooms choosing our other elected officials. We shouldn't have people doing that for circuit court judges either. We think it's important because circuit court judges are important. We need to have somebody in there who has compassion and respect for the community. We shouldn't just vote for people when they come in and they ask us for our vote. We know that I have been in the community for a really long time. I think everybody, well, the majority of you here have seen me many, many times. You see me, you know who I am, and you know that I haven't changed over the years. You know that if I am, elected circuit court judge, I will continue to be the same person because that's who I am. And so thank you very much. I really appreciate you giving me this time and I look forward to your questions right. later. Okay, yes. great. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Appreciate that. Thank you, um, Helen. We'll be having uh, questions, as we said, after, after the uh, presentation by uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Thomas P. Johnson III is running for Circuit Court Judge in Montgomery County, Maryland. He is an active uh, in the state bar. He is active in the state bar in Louisiana, the District of Columbia, and Maryland. He's handled cases in admin, state, and federal proceedings. His areas include bankruptcy, contracts, employment, FMLA Rehabilitation Act, Title VII, uh, insurance, and wrongful termination. Um, he also does medical malpractice, veterans disability, and workers comp cases. While in law school, he clerked for the New Orleans Legal Aid Society and he worked in public housing. He became the Social Security Disability Outreach Assistant Director in his last semester of law school. His community service includes the Board of Trustees and Parents Association, President of Washington Episcopal School from 2010 to 2012. He has assisted Montgomery County homeowners facing foreclosure. He has also done pro bono work in New Orleans and in Louisiana, assisting Hurricane Katrina homeowners with insurance claims and on pro bono basis. Welcome, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. 
I need to thank Marilyn for also encouraging me to. I come from humble beginnings. Um, my grandmother who educated me had a sixth grade education. Um, I lived in the public housing projects. Um, so I understand the needs of black and brown young people. I have a 21 year old son. I've been married to my wife, Emily, for 30 years. Um, and I have rededicated myself to listening to young people because our judicial system is not fair to young people. Um, I want to be a judge because I feel that our courts, Montgomery County in particular, is not reflective of the community. Montgomery County has 24 circuit court judges and has not had an African-American male in nine years. The last was Eric Johnson, no relation. I know Eric personally. Um, I would also say that Marilyn, um, I'm not only running for myself, um, I also would like to have Marilyn on the bench too because I would need a friend. We ran in the last election and there's a judge uh, that said that the judicial system was not, was fair to people of color. She was called out. Our governor who in his two terms has not appointed an African-American male in Montgomery County, Howard County, and around the county and Charles County to the bench. So here's what I expect that people understand. You have 17 people who is allowed to be appointed to the circuit courts in Maryland. These 17 people are not voted on by the public but selected by an elite, uh, an elite few. These 17 people decide who will become a judge. However, they call their decision-making a vetting process. In reality, it prevents voter representation and damages the integrity of our criminal justice system. The nomination commission might be as well made up of one person, our governor. And Maryland has had the same governor for the last seven years. This is why the elections are so important. Appointed judges must face their voters exactly one time in 15 years. Only then can Maryland residents decide for themselves whether their judges are dispensing justice. The pretrial incarceration rate in Montgomery County is higher than the national average. According to the circuit court, the standard time for processing a case is six months. Why should you be in prison for six months if you're innocent? The victims of this system are disproportionately low income and people of color. This is not what justice looks like. I am a candidate because I want to make an effort to correct the problem. I'm asking for your vote. I hope that you and others in the community are aware of what I just said, because it's been an ongoing cycle. Um, we get the same judges, we get they're from the same cloth. Do they care? They won't exhaust their dockets. And I am not a person, a prosecutor coming before me saying, I'm not prepared or I need an extension of time for no reason. I will go to his or her boss and say, send me attorneys that are well-prepared, well-qualified, and make sure that a defendant, and especially an indigent defendant, gets the proper representation that he or she may need. Because you must not put people in jail if they are innocent. I feel that my legal aid experience qualifies me for the position more than anything I've ever done. Um, I've litigated against, as a solo practitioner, against some of the major corporations and are uh, successfully litigated against them. You will hear that attorneys like myself have not been in court in a while. 
cases are settled before they get to court. Most companies settle their cases. Most individuals want the case settled because it's cost effective. People don't have the resources that can afford attorneys. And, my, and most of my representation are landscapers, Hispanic landscapers, so people don't wanna pay for their work. Getting back to legal aid, working for poor people, people with very little or no means, very little education has opened my eyes to the fact that they need representation, just like I have a client coming to me, paying me billable hours or taking me on retainers. They deserve the same representation. And our judicial system is flawed. It's flawed because we, innocent people plead out and in order to get out of jail instead of going before a judge and letting the judge hear the facts of their case and also having the opportunity to put on a defense. So I'm here before you today to ask for your vote and consider the things that I've just said about letting someone else decide, 17 individuals decide for you who will be your judge or you can decide for yourself by voting who the person you want to be become your judge. Thank you. And thank the uh, Progressive Legacy Organization for having me today and everyone here today for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. You're very enlightening. <laughs> uh, we had uh, a chat question that uh, my wife will read for you too. Okay. Uh, this question is from Ed Kimmel. Uh, the people who support the sitting judges, the site, the fact that the Judicial Review Committee has vetted them, that among other things means that they review the items that would be on their resume, which at minimum includes their academic profile and other academic honors, such as class standing, law review, moot court, and their publications. What law schools, undergraduate colleges, et cetera? Would you Ed, to... do you have any anything to add to that question? Unmute yourself. <laughs> I figured I, that. Am I muted? No, he is. No, okay. I, I was. I had to unmute myself to respond to your question. Okay. Go yeah, ahead. What, what would you say were your academic qualifications to be on the bench? And do you want me to go first? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ed. It's a pleasure to see you. I miss you. I haven't seen you in a long time. I miss the beautiful pictures that you take of us all the time. That's a very good question because it does mean that, you know, there's, <laughs> it does mean that there are qualifications that need to be met. However, the administrative office of the courts have vetted us. Uh, even if the uh, if the governor's commission has vetted us, the administrative office of the courts has. And before you could run for judge, you have to get a letter from the administrative office of the courts in Annapolis to say that you have met all the qualifications. And when you have that letter, you take that letter to the board of elections, and only then will the board of elections put you on the ballot to run for judge. And I I think. What needs to happen <laughs> is you need to ask yourself, you know, who are these 13 people? Do you know these 13 people? Uh, do you know what their characters are? Do you know what kind of conflicts of interest they might have? Because as I stated before, one of the people who's running today uh, on the slate, her law partner was on the governor's 13 member commission. In Montgomery County, that commission is kind of interesting because that commission is made up of 13 lawyers. And to me, that says a lot because I'm a, I'm a board member of the State Board of Occupational Therapy. And the reason why I am a board member there is because I am not an occupational therapist. I am there as a public member and my job is to protect the public. When I was on the Montgomery County Criminal Justice Coordinating Commission, I was a public member. 
which means that my job was there was uh, to protect the public. And it's important to have public members on these commission. If you go to the court, uh, court of Appeals' website, you'll see the members on the commission for each county. And you'll notice that some commissions have more public members there than they have lawyers. And that really, really says a lot. Out of the four people who are running on the slate, one of them is a is the daughter of a of a of a judge, and she's also from one of the law firms that tout how so many of their lawyers become judges. Uh, and then we have one who, as I said, stated before, her her law partner is on the commission. Why would somebody who has monetary interest in someone becoming a judge? be there to be able to make that decision, or even if he didn't make that decision, push that decision along or encourage that decision. It doesn't make any sense. So what they're saying in terms of, you know, we were chosen by these members. Well, you were chosen by these members, but we, the public, don't know what these members found important. And as I said before, if you look at the robingroom.com, you'll see that all the judges on that on the list in Montgomery County have been appointed, but they are very, very, well, many of them are very, very wanting. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put the information for you in the chat and you could check for yourself as you listen to Mr. Johnson answer that question. Thank that, you. That, I'm sorry. That, Go I'm, ahead, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, that question is really, Interesting. I always find that question interesting because I always start out whether you're looking for a qualified person to be a judge or um, someone what supposedly a, a impeccable academic credentials or went to one of the top tier law schools that you know you assume they're going to be a good judge. I, I take issue with it because our last Supreme Court appointment had never tried a, a, a case. Um, you know, she, you know, it, it's just a, a, a fact. Um, I've known great judges who graduated bottom of their class. You know, they turned out to be phenomenal judges, uh, writing opinions of circuit courts. So I think the question is, you know, and, and, and I want to separate myself from the, the, the other candidates in a sense to say, my name right now is on the ballot for President Biden's list for a US District Court nomination. Now, that process, um, I, went, I, I don't think I'm going to get it, but my name is there, OK? But that process in and of itself is daunting, okay? First of all, they do a thorough background check. They vet you like you've never been vetted before. They know everything on you, okay? And then you have to be qualified. So the question, to answer that person's question, there is no one that's sitting as a current judge that I'm running against that is qualified have qualified themselves to be appointed to a U.S. District Court federal judge. Thank you. I, I, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> and uh, we would like to uh, be specific. In one case, someone has asked Marilyn of Poor One, which is, uh, what would be your first action upon assuming a judgeship, Marilyn? Well, thank you very much for that question. My first action on assuming a judgeship is to actually speak with my fellow colleagues on the bench. I, I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand why Maryland incarcerates a higher percentage of its young black males than any other state. It doesn't make any sense to me. We are not the most crime-ridden state. We are not, we don't have the most uh, criminally minded young black males. Yet we are, <laughs> and according to the Justice, uh, ju the Justice Policy Institute, the reason that we are is because the judges give them excessive sentences, and to me that is really, really something that that 
is hurting us, the community, because excessive sentences don't reduce public safety. As a matter of fact, it makes things even worse because people don't believe in the system and when they don't believe in the system, chaos entails. They said that what, what uh, helps in terms of public safety is to be firm, consistent, and, and um, well, it's to be firm and consistent. That's what we need to do. We, we don't, uh, I'm sorry, it's to be fair, firm, and consistent. That's what we need to do. We need to be fair, firm, and consistent. I think that a judge's role is to make sure that people who, who need to be held accountable are held accountable. I think that a judge's role is sometimes to, you know, figuratively hold the hand of someone who is going through one of the worst times of their lives. I've said it before, I love being a lawyer, but I look around the, the courthouse on a daily basis. <laughs> and, I, and I say that had I not worked here, I would not want to be a party here in any case that I could think of. And it's really important that we, oh, I, I see Kathy saying that the link doesn't work. I'm going to check it again and, and send it to you when I'm, I'm done. It, it, it's really important that we see judges as the public servant that they are. They're not supposed to be sitting on a bench high and mighty looking down on the rest of us. They're supposed to look at us and see our humanity. And they're supposed to make their decisions based on the evidence, based on seeing people as people, based on knowing that no matter what you look like, no matter what religion you are, your sexual orientation or your gender or whatever isms might be there, that those things, unless they relate to the case, should not come into the decision-making process. So th what the first thing that I would do is talk to my colleagues to make sure that they are, they understand that they are looking at real people when they're making these decisions. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, for Mr. Johnson, what has been the effect of Marilyn's decision to lower the number of cases subjected to cash bail? Well, here, here's the thing. Most people do not have money to begin with. Okay, just less low income people. Um, uh, that has been a problem. We've used bail as a way to fund a municipality. You know, some courts use it. I think there's a court in Tennessee right now. This lady, this judge prides herself on, 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 on cash bills because she knows it contributes to, when she's up for re-election, she knows that the money contributes to her campaign. Um, if a person who doesn't present a threat to society, let them out on their own recognizance. Um, you know, we have to, we have been a society where we have profited off of um, incarcerating people. We should be a society to help people stay out of the judicial system. So I think if I understand the question, lowering the requirement for cash bills, and some jurisdictions have done away with them altogether. Um, there's a problem in, in, in St. Louis, Missouri. You know, they, they've just got rid of them. Because as I'm repeating myself, if the person doesn't present a threat to society and you let them go and you know they're gonna return back, I mean, you can get them back to issue in a bench warrant. But I, I don't think, I think sometimes the cash bills are, are draconian and it, 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 it's a harsh, method to, to, to get someone back into court. And only the bail bondsmen, they're the only ones that's profiting from it. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Um, our next question is to, uh, I believe it's uh, Mr. Johnson and, and uh, yeah. Ms. Pierre. Um, you mentioned a high rate of pretrial detention and 97% of all cases are pled out. As a judge, can you discourage plea deals and bring more cases to trial? Marilyn, you wanna go first? Or you want me to go first? Well, I've been going first, so. 
I know it's International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. Yeah. So <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> defer to you. That's what I'm deferring to you. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. I have been in courtrooms where I have, well, I should go back a little bit saying that I love sitting in courtrooms. Some people find it entertaining to do other things, but I myself, I love sitting in courtrooms, watching cases. I, when, when I first started practicing law, I would go to the deputies and I would say, oh, what, you know, who's um, hearing an interesting case? And they would tell me, oh, so-and-so on the, you know, fifth floor. And I'll be like, okay, good. Thank you. Let me go over there. So I would go over there and, and I would watch cases. So I, I just love doing that. And because I, I have done that so much, <laughs> sometimes I sit there and I watch a case and you could tell that the person does not want to plead guilty, but, but there, there's some pressures that are put upon them and they in turn plead guilty. I have had other people come to me and, and say, you know, I didn't want to plead guilty to this, but my lawyer forced me, told me that it, it, you will never hear my client say that. Because I always say to them, you, this is your life. You are the one who is going to have to live with the consequences. So if you want to try the case, I will try the case. I will do the best that I can. And even though I think this is a good plea and you might want to take it, don't worry about what my, my uh, you know, what I'm going to do. Just worry about how this affects your life. And this is the way it affects your life. You know, and then we will go through that. I think it's really important not to have somebody plead guilty when they don't feel like it. We shouldn't do it because of judicial economy. We shouldn't do it because it's convenient to the Lord. I think that the system would work better if the prosecutors knew that they would, they would have to work better. <laughs> Sometimes so many things are buried because cases aren't tried. And I, I think if more cases were tried, the system would work better, we would get more justice. Yes, it would mean more, more, uh, more judges, more, uh, more lawyers, but I think it also means um, more justice. And I think justice is what the court system is there for. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Thomas, Mr. Uh, Johnson, would you like yeah, to? You can walk and call me Thomas. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, here, here's the thing. The way the system works, you have, okay, someone pretrial incarceration, the individual, um, let's say, has been sitting in jail for two months. And the prosecutor goes to the individual, or well, the, the defense attorney, the public defender goes to the individual and says, look, you know, he cuts a deal with the prosecutor and says, okay, if you please to lower um, a lower sentence, um, you know, a, a lower charge rather, we will give him um, credit for time served. That individual may be innocent. And the judge, you know, a good judge would sit there, a good judge would sit there and delve, do a deep dive and find out why this, this individual plead to the case because he wanted to get out of jail because was harming his family when he or she may be innocent. A judge has a responsibility to make sure that he or she checks the facts and make sure that the prosecutor is giving him all the information about the case. I can give you a great example in Virginia last year when there was an individual sitting in jail for three years, he had drugs planted on him. He pleaded, uh, pleaded guilty for three years instead of facing 15 years and they found out that he was innocent. So that comes to mind, and as a judge, that's in my system, because I want someone, because the Constitution says that this individual has to come to court within X amount of days, and he or she must be tried or you have to release them. So my thing is this, when a prosecutor comes before me, he or she better be prepared. I will read the case. I will ask the hard questions. I will make sure that that individual who has been charged with a crime, he or she 
has an opportunity to exercise their constitutional rights before me. I will not take a case and say, okay, you're taking a plea deal. You understand that, you know, they go through the, the, the routine that if you plead guilty, you give up all your rights. No, I wanna make sure if that individual is pleading guilty to something that he or she understands that they, if, they have, if they're innocent, they're losing every opportunity to present their innocence to me. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate your long and comprehensive answers to our questions. We have a few more questions, but we did devote a certain amount of time to uh, Mr. Hans Rima, who's running for uh, the um, Montgomery County, whatever. <laughs> Executive, thank you. Executive, yes. yes. Hans, so I, just, uh... I just wanted to say thank you very much uh, for giving us those detailed answers. And my wife will read a little blurb for you, Hans. So give her a little chance. Thank Hans you. Reamer is running for the county executive in Montgomery County. He has represented the entire county serving as an at-large member since 2010. He chairs the council's planning, housing and economic development committee and has been a leader on smart growth and housing among many issues. Before the council, Hans served as Barack Obama's national youth vote director, and he organized national campaigns that defeated the privatization of social security. He lives in Tacoma Park with his wife, Angela, and their two boys, both Montgomery County public mm. school students. Go ahead, Hans. Well, thank you for the invitation to join you this evening. I am uh, I'm excited to have the chance to have some conversation. Um, so would it be helpful if I just shared a quick, uh, you know, introductory comment and then we go to- Absolutely. Discussion? Please be free. Okay, great. Uh, well, I am excited to run for county executive. I, I think Montgomery County is an amazing place. And I think we need leadership in the county that is embracing our future and is forward looking and is willing to make the kind of decisions that we need so that our community continue to thrive and prosper and succeed and create the resources that we need to uh, invest in our community and support our agenda to create opportunity for all residents in this county. And uh, I, I am excited about who we are and, and where we're going, but I'm also concerned about our trends. I, I think that you know, we have a challenge in this county with economic development and job creation. We, are, you know, we actually have fewer private sector jobs today than we had 10 years ago. You know, that, that is, that's really a big problem for us. You know, uh, I think it's really expensive to live in this county. We, we have a big challenge with housing for the workforce and housing for empty nesters and young people. And you know, I, I want my kids, my two boys to be able to live here. And I'm concerned that you know, there may not be jobs for them. There may not be housing. And I think we need county executive leadership that is forward thinking on jobs and housing. And, and we really don't have that. We really don't have that today. I, I am passionate about climate change. Uh, it's why I fought so hard to legalize solar in this county uh, because we need solar everywhere if we're gonna shut down coal powered uh, power plants. And you know that uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about how much progress our county is making towards our climate goals. And I'm passionate about police reform. I, you know, I've been working hard on that issue before you know, George Floyd, uh, his tragic murder, and, and before that cause became a household cause, you know, I, I've been working on police reform um, because I believe that the work that police do is really important in the community. And when the community is not behind policing, when there's a break of community trust, then, you know, police are less successful. And of course, our community uh, does not feel safe and, and is not feeling protected. And uh, beginning in about 2018, I worked to create the first policing advisory commission, uh, which has been really growing and building in its influence. And I have worked to reform di discipline and I've worked to change bargaining rules that have uh, empowered the, the police union to uh, excessively and unduly control public policy in this county and to block and thwart uh, reform to how police do their work. And, you know, our county executive has really uh, sided with the police union on many and many of those critical issues. So um, there, there's so much that I could say, but I, I want to just uh, 
you know, I'll, in a moment, I'll turn it back to you. But well, I'll just conclude with I'm running as a public finance candidate. And I, I'm sure you know what that's all about. But I am not taking funds from PACs and I'm not taking funds from corporations or or, uh, you know, big donors. I am running totally on the basis of support from grassroots residents in the county. And we're putting together a really strong campaign. It, it is it's growing and building in the last election. Uh, you know, that was my third time on the ballot and we got 55,000 votes and um, that, you know, far more than either of the, the two leading county executive candidates got in their election. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm well known around the county. I've hopefully had a chance to work on issues that you care about. And uh, you've hopefully seen work that I've done that, you know, you, you appreciate and you value. And I think that that is going to, uh, you know, be an important factor in this election. So, um Thanks for taking the time, and and I can't help but uh, you know just comment. I know you know, uh, of course, the the um, uh, the very unfortunate event that occurred when Councilmember Jawando was here, um, and I'm I'm glad that you're continuing forward. What happened to him was outrageous, and uh, it shouldn't happen. And I spoke out about it at the council, and and we all did, and uh, it's really, you know, it, it's terrible. As as a parent to two black boys, my, my wife is black. And, you know, I, I, it's something that worries me uh, tremendously, because those two kids, you know, I know that they're gonna, they're, they're, the, the life that they leave is certainly different than the one that I, I lead, you know, when, when, when they walk around in downtown Silver Spring, you know, others might look at them differently than they would have looked at me as a kid, you know, they, people might think that they're up to things that aren't good, even though they're not, you know, and, and teachers might not really uh, necessarily believe in their potential as much and employers might not you know recognize their skills and I, I think that's a real uh, a real tragedy and it's something I want to help do something about and it's been part of the work that I've been focused on as as council member trying to tackle racism and you know combat it and uh, and make the investments in our kids and, and in racial healing that is needed to uh, over the long term overcome that so Thank, Thank you, you so uh, much, for, Councilman for Raymond. Being here. Yes, we have some questions for you. Great. Uh, the first question is: What are your top priorities if elected as county county executive? Thank you. Well, I think the first job, which is a long term job, is really focusing on an economic development strategy for this county that can get our engine growing again and start creating jobs and supporting small business mm -hmm. and putting us back into a mode of, of positive evolution in our economy. And you've seen in this region how all the economic growth has moved to Virginia. And, you know, that is having a huge impact on this county. It's not a good impact. It's very bad. Uh, the second job, which is more immediate, is really focusing on education and educational recovery. And I, I am very distressed by the lack of progress that our kids have made in school over the last couple of years. I you know COVID has been devastating in so many different ways. And we're gonna to have to have all hands on deck and a, and a county executive who's really focused on education in order to try to regain some of that ground that has been lost. And, and I am very concerned about the executive's lack of attention on education. I think the return to school didn't go well in January and didn't go well in September. And I think that's inexcusable. So, uh, you know, jobs and housing, and education are gonna be my immediate priorities as I take office. Well, thank you. Uh, another question. Many of the issues of policing involve their encounters with people with mental health issues. What is the county doing to address this? Are there plans to adopt a model like the Cahoots from Eugene, Oregon? Uh, thank you to whoever asked that question we love the cahoots from eugene oregon that that is a model program that seeks to substitute first responders who have mental health expertise uh substitute them for police uh who sometimes when they come into a given search situation you know might provoke a bad reaction from the person who they are encountering that leads to you know, a violent interaction and ultimately uh, likely to the death of, of that person. Uh, and we've seen this happen many times in this county, sadly, over the last number of years. You know, many of the uh, black men, particularly, who have been killed by police officers in this county are, have been experiencing a mental health episode. And I don't think we have done nearly enough to make that switch. 
uh, to bring that expertise into our police department so that they know when it's time to pass something off, to build that into 911 so that the dispatching you know, has a seamless approach. I think we've got a long ways to go, but I do believe in that. And that is one of the reasons why I have fought so hard on this question of whether to have police officers in our schools. I, I really think that if there is one place where we have the staff, you know, we have the trained professional adults to work with a, the community without relying on, you know, a badge and a gun. If there's one place where we can do that, it's in a school. You know, that's that is that is ground where we we've got the resources to help kids if they're experiencing a challenge to find out what's going on with their lives and and not criminalize behavior that is you know perhaps youth behavior and and not so unusual uh, or at the same time uh, you know keep kids safe with more effective interventions and violence prevention techniques. So yes, uh, I think we need to very broadly move in that direction of shifting where appropriate, uh, shifting away from police and towards other kinds of responses. And there's just so many different examples of how we could do that better. Thank, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming out and letting us hear about your ideas and how you would like to do the job that you're aspiring to. County executive is a very difficult job. You have a lot of, a lot of different things coming at you all at once. <laughs> And you have to try to balance them all ahead of a pin, it, it appears sometimes. But thank you very much. Okay, thanks for your time. Appreciate the invitation to be with you tonight. Thank you. Go ahead, Alan, your, your meeting. I'm just uh, the, the technical guy. Um, it was good to hear from uh, Marilyn Pierre, Thomas Johnson, and uh, Councilmember Reamer. I thought we'd get to ask Councilmember Reamer uh, a few more questions. I had some questions that I wanted to ask about housing, um, affordable housing, uh, because that's an issue that's really important to most of us and doesn't get discussed uh, discussed mm -hmm. often. Um, but uh, I really appreciate everybody coming to uh, this conversation you know, this afternoon and uh, raising so many issues. The, uh, he, he could be back. <laughs> um, Council, Council Member Reamer, you're still there? Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I inferred that my time was up and so I dropped well, it, off. I'm glad to be back. It yeah, was, in effect it, it was, but the point is we would like to ask you a few more questions. It was, well, it, was confu it was confusing, Hans, so, uh, we uh, we apologize for that, and thanks for the kind words you said about our last meeting, which was really uh, very concerning to all of us. Um, sometimes around the issues of uh, police accountability and transparency, you get that kind of reaction. I posted a question in chat. Um, it won't come. It won't be surprising to you. I know that uh, housing has been one of your top priorities. Um, the uh, Council of Governments and the Planning Board say that we're going to need tens of thousands of new affordable housing units over the next 30 years. Um, personally, I don't think that the attainable housing study and those uh, policies will get us there. I wonder what you, what's your thought about how we can create the tens of thousands of new housing units, affordable housing units that we need so that uh, teachers and police officers uh, firemen and working class people can uh, live in the county. Yeah, thank you so much. Alan, it's great to see you. Uh, you know, for those who don't know, I, I had a chance to serve with Alan in 2005 on the Neighborhoods Committee in the Silver Spring Advisory Board. And uh, 17 years ago, Alan, that was a long time, but long time. you still look the same. You still look the same. Um, you know, housing is a critical issue. And as you observed, uh, it is one that is making this county unaffordable and particularly well for a lot of different people at different levels of income. But, you know, I think it's becoming uh, pronounced, especially at the workforce level. And, you know, I always like to ask, uh, you know, people I, I encounter like, hey, where do you live? And I, I often find with folks who are like, you know, it, they work at the dentist's office or they are in personal services, you know, increasingly they live in Frederick, you know, they live in uh, Howard, you know, they're, they even live in Virginia, you know, 
and it's public and private sector. You have pointed out, you know, police or fire or teachers, and I think it's, you know, that extends into the private sector as well. And it's why the theme of my campaign in a lot of ways is just making the changes that we have to make so that this county can be affordable to our workforce and our young workers and our empty nesters. There's a lot of empty nesters who I think would be happy to move out of the you know, family that they raised, the house that they raised their family in, if there was a great place for them to land. And we don't have enough of that. So first of all, there is a supply and demand problem. And you know, that's the kind of underlying tectonic issue here, which is we're a housing shortage community. Uh, where, you know, like West Coast mm -hmm. style, where there's just far more demand for housing than we are creating uh, supply to meet. And in fact, our, our annual numbers are about half of what they used to be. Uh, so we are meeting about half of what we think is the annual need for new housing in the county. And it should be no surprise that when you don't, you know, when you only produce half of the supply that you need year after year after year after year, it just adds up and it creates all kinds of problems in the in the housing market. And that you know shows up with significant affordability issues. How to address that? You know, it's multiple, uh, multiple dimensions. First of all, you know, we need the housing market to get going again. So that was why I pushed hard to get rid of the housing moratorium as an example, which the county executive opposed, you know, getting rid of a moratorium on new housing where housing wants to be, you know, in the places where investment wants to go. You know, I thought that was uh, you know, really important for us to do. That's why I have uh, worked on master plans like downtown Bethesda or Littonsville or Silver Spring or, you know, Long Branch, uh, you know, up and down Rockville Pike, Montgomery Village, you know, to allow for new housing to come in where it isn't presently allowed. And, you know, we have a market opportunity uh, county executive has opposed opposed me on all those measures as well, even voted against the Bethesda master plan. Um, you know, it's why I've been working hard to create financing for uh, set aside affordable housing for our lowest income residents. It's why I raised the MPDU requirement for housing in more affluent areas so that lower income county residents would have a chance to live in some of the more expensive neighborhoods of the county. You know, there, there are so many things that the attainable housing piece is just one small piece of a very big puzzle. Um, you know, we did pass the accessory dwelling unit proposal that I proposed. Council passed unanimously. County executive fought us pretty, uh, pretty assertively for a long time on that. Um, that's a big, that, that's an important piece of the attainable housing vision. Um, but, you know, I think the broader story here is it takes many, many, many different kinds of policies to put the housing, you know, to, to address the housing crisis because it's a broad and deep crisis. And, um, you know, I, I am deeply concerned that uh, by the county executive's anti-housing policies. And I think this county is, we're never gonna tackle those issues if we don't get different leadership in place. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Other, I knew that was your wheelhouse. Other uh, other questions? I mean, I have dozens of them. It would be unfair for me to ask all, all of them. But uh, while other people are thinking about their questions, let me ask Council Member Reamer this question. Um, one of the things that some of my colleagues are interested in is refunding an office that was in county government called the Office of the People's Council. Um, we saw that as a way to sort of balance the playing field between the, the people with the financial interest in the economy with uh, with residents. I wonder if uh, you have a perspective on the Office of the People's Council, its utility, and whether or not you would support a recommendation from the, from the county executive, and I hope the council president to uh, refund that in the next year's budget. Well, with the, if the executive sends it, I will definitely take a look. I mean, we, we've looked at that a lot over the years. Um, you know, generally what we have seen is there's a lot of concerns about how effective it would be and it kind of create a, a false sense of influence uh, that wouldn't pan out and would just lead to a lot of frustration. Um, and so many people have said, you know, if you create it, you're, you're kind of just, um, you're setting an un unrealistic expectation that the residents will ultimately find, you know, very disappointing. And so it's better to direct them to take their case directly to the planning board or to the county government, you know, rather than through an intermediary. 
I, I don't know. I don't have a strong view on it. I haven't really had to grapple with it because it's never come to the county council, as far as I recall. And uh, if it is in the budget, then we'll absolutely take a look at that. Other questions? While you are formulating your questions, uh, Councilmember Reamer, what's your position on the Dickerson uh, incinerator? Um, does it need to be closed down? What will we do with the solid waste? Is it yeah. fair to ship it to uh, to uh, landfills that are near communities of uh, um, color in other uh, jurisdictions? Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Well, you know, first of all, I, I, I would support shutting it down, provided that the environmental impact, you know, analysis shows that that is indeed the most climate favorable thing to do. Um, the thing we have to remember is that landfilling creates methane gas and methane gas is worse for the climate than the burning of waste. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit unclear what is the most beneficial from a climate perspective. Um, but I am, I am looking at that. We're looking at that and I am totally open to it. And, you know, I, I think shutting it down over the long term. Absolutely. I think we do need to shut it down over the long term, um, you know, by putting in place effective uh, composting. You know, there's no reason for us to burn organic matter like that can all be composted and, you know, without producing methane. Um, you know, there's a lot of evolution in the recycling sector, and there's possible ways that we could actually gasify our waste and no longer burn it um, and use the, the gasification uh, to substitute for natural gas uh, that is, you know, burned in buildings. Um, so there's a lot of things that we could do. I do have concerns about exporting our waste to other communities. Um, and, you know, uh, that... To me, that is sort of not consistent with the core principle of, of you know, sustainability and leaving things better than you found them and, you know, uh, clean up your own mess or, you know, if you brought it, take it out. Um, so I, I, I have some real concerns about that. If the county wanted to landfill in the county, you know, I think that would be kind of less troublesome. Um, but uh you know, this is a complicated one. I, I will say, I think the executive really hasn't put the effort into this that he should. And, you know, there has been a longstanding issue with getting a composting facility up and running, and he just has not delivered on that. And um, that'll be my, my job one. You know, if I'm county executive, I want to get a composting facility funded in the budget, you know, and send that right away. Um, I'm a huge composter. I've always been. My parents started composting when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, you can really reduce the amount of waste that you send to, uh, you know, our incinerator if you just take out all the vegetables and the fruit and the meat and the cheese and the, you know, cotton and other organic materials. And uh, once we do that, you know, we could reduce our waste stream significantly. So I'd like to get that done as well. There's another question in the chat. Uh from Sandy Robinson, what are your views? Uh, I guess what are your priorities for uh, climate change issues? Um, she said you you've addressed some of the issues, talking about the incinerator and composting. Um, do you have some other priorities? And you talked about solar too. You want to talk? I'll about say that? a little bit more about you know clean energy. So, um, if you looked at the climate action report uh, that we produced, what you see is that almost all of the emissions reductions that that plan identifies come from what we call fuel switching. Uh, fuel switching is get the coal and the natural gas power out of the grid, replace it with solar and wind, get the gasoline out of the vehicles, replace it with electric powered by solar and wind. Like more than 80% of the climate reduction of the of the emissions reductions actually comes from those that that you know that process of switching your fuels it that it is achieved through different things like the community clean choice community choice energy um, you know things like that but you know that assumes that you're creating enough clean energy that's the crucial thing is can we create enough clean energy to shut down coal and to get the transportation sector off of gas. 
Um, and if we could do that, if we could get out of coal and gas, then we can take our emissions down radically, you know, 80%, um, and, and suddenly actually be on a sustainable path. And I think it's possible. Like, that's what I love about it. It's actually possible. And, you know, for the last couple of years, ever since I took on the battle about solar in the rural areas of the county, you know, I got excited about it because for the first time in my life, I felt like there's actually a way to do this. We can generate enough solar and wind to get out of coal and gas. We can. It works. Uh, it's proven. Um, and so we just have to do that. We just have to get to work on generating that solar and that wind. And then once we do, we can shift all vehicles to plug in electric and shift all, you know, get out of all of the home heating equipment and the building heating equipment that is gas, which by the way, as we know, is a terrible safety issue also. Um, you know, shut down, all, you know, get rid of all the gas burners on your in your kitchen. Like we can do this, it works. So in order to make that happen, we gotta have solar everywhere and wind everywhere. And Montgomery County isn't really a place that has a lot of wind potential, but we do have a lot of solar potential. So uh, I, I wanna see us building a solar strategy where we're helping homeowners get solar on their rooftops. We're helping commercial building owners get solar on their rooftops and over their parking lots. We're putting it on public property everywhere we possibly can. And we're allowing property owners to put it anywhere. You know, or yeah, just about anywhere. I won't say totally anywhere because that's a big expansive statement, but just about anywhere. Um, and so in order to do that, what I had proposed was that if you are a farmer, as long as you were willing to continue to farm the land, you can put solar on the same land that you're farming. So in other words, you can't stop farming that land. You have to continue to grow crops underneath the panels or raise sheep or raise chickens. Uh, or you know, support pollinator plants so that the bees are pollinating your crop from that land. As long as you're willing to do that, like we would allow you to create uh, solar, uh, to install solar panels. And um, sadly, ran into a you know massive wall of resistance. The county executive really spearheaded the resistance, and we got virtually nothing out of that, unfortunately. But uh, we could actually power every building in this county locally from solar if we wanted to. That's how much land we have. And it wouldn't even be a large fraction of, of all of our farmland. It wouldn't even really be a big fraction of all of our farmland. What I proposed was just 2% of our farmland should be allowed for that dual use com combining solar and, and, uh, and agriculture. And that would have powered 50,000 homes. You know, we've only got 400,000 homes in the county, you know, so like we could do this and I want to do it. We're, we're going to figure it out if I'm elected. We're going to, we're going to figure out how to power every building in this county from solar and wind. Let's ask uh, Council Member Reamer one final question on public safety and police. There's a question in the chat. What's your position on uh, police in schools, uh, school resource officers? And I would add to that question. It looks like the Fraternal Order of Police and the County Executive reached an agreement to raise the uh, uh, police uh, officers starting salaries um, to, I guess, enhance recruitment. Um, do you have a position um, on uh, the increase uh, increased salaries for law enforcement? And what's your position on school resource officers? Sure. Well, first of all, we do have a very serious issue attracting people into uh, police work. Uh, you know, the number of new recruits that we have now are down. Um, I, I don't know that, it, you know, historically, the county, the, the police union has said, we're not as concerned with the first year's salary. We want to put all of our eggs in the 10th year's salary and the 20th year's salary, because that's what your pension gets based on. And so, you know, they look at a person entering, becoming a police officer, and they say, let's not worry about the first three years. Let's look at their 20 years of employment, and then their 40 years of retirement. Let's maximize that. Um, now they're saying, well, what about those first two years too? <laughs> so, uh, you know, okay. I think that having competitive pay is important because we need to be able to attract police officers. I also think that if you want to get people interested in being police officers, we've got to save the profession. I mean, what is going on right now is all of the, un, you know, the terrible, 
the terrible things that happen in policing are now public for everyone to see. And as a result, there's been a massive backlash. And so people don't want to be police officers. And I know I'm getting a lot of people on Twitter who say to me, your police reform stuff is, you know, driving people away from the profession. No, <laughs> what's driving people away from the profession is they see, you know, horrible incidents and then the community it, it is outraged by, you know, officers who are not acting ethically and, and, and you know, and, and responsibly. And then they say, why would I want to be a police officer, you know, in, in that environment? And we got to solve that because if we don't solve that, no one's going to want to be a police officer anymore. And then we're going to really have a, a, a serious problem because we need police officers. They're, they're the ones who can keep kinds of crime. Like, absolutely. We need police officers. So, you know, broadly, that's, that's the context. Like, I believe in police work is important, but I believe that if we don't reform how police do their job to build community trust, that we're heading down, you know, the wrong path and it's never going to solve itself. To the, to the question about police officers in schools, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, I think this is a great example of where we don't really need police officers. You know, we, yes, you need them when there's a violent incident, like if there's something serious that happens, okay, but, you know, high schools have security staff. They have somewhere between five and 10 security staff each. Uh, they have administrators. They have, and they should have more. So what I would do rather than having a police officer, I would have a violence prevention staffer, you know, who is more like a social worker and a coach who knows those kids. And, you know, it's only a small group of kids. It, it, crime is committed by a small group of people. Same thing in school. It's a small group of kids who are struggling in their life, making bad decisions, subject to terrible influences, and occasionally make really bad decisions. And I would have a violence prevention staffer whose job is to know that kid, each of those kids, and know what's going on in their life, and have that trusted relationship so that when that kid is starting to fight with another kid, you know, somebody tells somebody, and then we can get in, we can get in, we can stop it from escalating and we can save lives. And I, I fear that what we have now is, is ineffective, that those kids who are, you know, most at risk of making bad decisions and, and, and acting out in terrible ways, they don't want to talk to a police officer. You know, they don't want to talk to someone with a badge and a gun. And other kids do. Other kids like them. Yes, I know that. But those aren't the kids we're concerned with. We want to prevent the crime from happening. That's what we want to do. We want to stop the crime from happening. We need to figure out how, what kind of professional, what kind of adult can best build that relationship with those 25 or 50 children in that school, those high school students, and help stop things before they happen by giving those kids some hope, some relationships, some guidance, some mentorship, you know, resources, access to all kinds of things that they need. And I just think that there are better ways that there would be lots of adults who would be more successful at that. Now, again, if there's a violent incident, somebody brings a gun to school, you know, you got to have police available. No question about that. But, you know, that's just generally my philosophy is that I think we could do more effective work in the school setting with a different kind of professional. And when you put those professionals in place, I think it would allow you to withdraw the police officers, but I think there's a legitimate concern. You just withdraw the police officers and you're not adding something in. What have you done? You've just removed a resource. And generally my, my big point here is we got to do more, not less. It's, you know, it's, we can't just withdraw a resource. We need, we have a mental health crisis and we need to be adding resources into the schools. And I think violence prevention should be a resource that we add. And whether it, I, I would guess, probably two professionals in each school, each high school, you know, are needed to help be on top of things and, and help, help that school community safe and, and ultimately engage the kids and the families and the faculty and the staff and train the, you know, train all of the security staff differently and give the coaches resources and have a whole community that's focused on safety. Like we can do this. Well, thank you, Councilmember Reamer, for joining us this afternoon and for your eloquent and comprehensive answers to some of the questions that we posed. We enjoyed uh, having you. So on behalf of uh, uh, Progressive Legacy, thank you uh, very much. We're going to go back to our, our group view and uh, okay. 
we're going to have Hank sign us off. Hank. We Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. We had an extraordinary time together. I think it was very comprehensive. Of that. I felt like I really got to know the, the speakers. Um, a little hiccups here and there, but I think uh, I turn it over to our, our uh, leader uh, at six o'clock exactly. <laughs> and we were thinking that that would have been a good enough, but he, he, he cautiously thought, Maybe Mr. Reamer needed to have a little something to say. It was a little in addition to what he said. And it was very, very good for us to hear him. Um, I would like to thank everyone who helped me and, uh, and continues to propagate the information that needs to get out. And thank you again. And everybody, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the presence of Robert Bass. Uh, he has spoken to us before. He's a candidate for Montgomery County Sheriff and the um, upcoming primary election, which may be in June, may be in September. I don't know that they've uh, figured that out yet. But uh, uh, Mr. Bass, thank you so much for uh, joining us. It's good to see you and uh, look forward to talking to you very, very soon. Um, we are going to uh, conclude this uh, meeting and recording and I'd ask everybody to stay stay tuned so hold on for a second uh, thank you everybody